So thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, as volunteers of the Bruce Trail Conservancy Citizen Science Program. So I'm Megan Kroll and I've been with the BTC since late 2017 and I am the volunteer coordinator. So tonight we are very thrilled to be presenting to you the observations collected over the last three years from our iNaturalist project contributed by volunteers like yourselves. Uh, and so first I'd just like to say a big thank you for all you've done to contribute to the project. Uh, we're really grateful for the time and energy you've put into taking those observations, identifying, uploading them. It's really given us a really great data kind of set to start with here. Uh, if you're newer to the project and you haven't had a chance to contribute yet, uh, that's okay. We're, we're happy to have you and we look forward to all your future observations that you can bring to the table. Um, so this project started off seeking only flora observations and then we expanded to include fungi and then birds. And now we're looking for any and all observations that you can take while out on the Bruce Trail. Uh, and so I encourage you to continue contributing whenever you can. Um, I'm sure lots of you are taking advantage of this time to try and spend some time outdoors. And uh, if you're out there and you see something and you wanna take an observation, we welcome it. Uh, we're definitely kind of thinking forward with this program here and different ways we can expand as well. So we had a really great opportunity to collaborate in 2019. And it was supposed to be in 2022 as well, but unfortunately uh, the pandemic had other plans for us, uh, but we had a collaboration in 2019 on some birding hikes with Birds Canada and got some training on how to use eBird there as well, which was really great. And uh, we have another collaborative opportunity coming with Dr. Carolyn Isles of McMaster University with regard to escarpment erosion, which is also really exciting. So lots to look forward to here. Uh, so in terms of tonight's webinar, we'll be sharing lots about what we found from almost 10,500 observations thus far. Uh, so that's really exciting. There will be an opportunity for a couple of questions at the end, if there are any in terms of the data we'll be sharing. Uh, so please feel free to ask a question using the Q&A. Um, if you're using a computer, it'll be just down at the bottom. And if you're on an iPad, if you just tap your screen, you'll see your options pop up and you'll find the Q&A that way. Um, if you have a question related more to how iNaturalist works or something more technical, please feel free to send me an email directly if you'd like, and I can work on answering that for you. Uh, so my email is mcroll, C-R-O-L-L, -L, at brucetrail.org. Finally, we are recording tonight's presentation as we're looking forward to sharing it with more people. Uh, we will be sharing it on our website on the Citizen Science page along with the actual report of the data. So very similar to what the presentation is tonight, it'll be in a report form um, and we'll be presenting that on the website and we'll be sharing it with you later this evening or tomorrow. Uh, so that's been compiled by Mara McAfee. So with that, I don't wanna hold the floor too long here as I'd really like to pass it over to Mara to get into the fun stuff of this evening. Uh, so for those of you who have yet to interact with Mara, I hope you get to soon. Mara has been working as an ecologist with the BTC since September of 2020. So she's our newest member on staff and her primary role is managing the BTC's new landowner stewardship program. Uh, she is a certified arborist. She holds a bachelor of science in wildlife biology and conservation from the University of Guelph and a master of science in biology from McMaster University. So prior to joining the BTC, Mara held roles in both the academic and nonprofit spheres she has conducted ecological research in a variety of ecosystems from the grasslands of Southern Ontario to the boreal forest of Northwest Territories. In the nonprofit field, she carried out environmental education and community stewardship projects for local organizations, including the Royal Botanical Gardens and the Hamilton Naturalists Club, who I'm sure you're, both, you're all very familiar with both of these organizations. Maybe some of you have done some work for them yourselves. Uh, so as you can see, she's the perfect person to be assigned with compiling and analyzing this data. So with that, I'm going to let Mara take over. And uh, thank you so much, Mara, for taking care of doing this kind of step in our process here. And we look forward to hearing the report. Over to you, Mara. Thanks, Megan. And hello, everyone. It's uh, nice to be here tonight. And I'm really excited to share this data with you. So we'll get right into it. Okay, uh, before we get into the iNaturalist data, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the BTC. I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with it, but I always just like to start with that. 
Um, so the Bruce Trail is Canada's oldest and longest marked footpath. It spans about 900 kilometers from Niagara uh, to Tobermory along the Niagara Escarpment. And the Bruce Trail Conservancy, as I'm sure you're all aware, is a member-driven volunteer-based charitable organization, and we're committed to caring for the Bruce Trail and the wilderness that surrounds it. And so our mission is preserving a ribbon of wilderness for everyone forever. And so you can see we're more than just a trail organization. We really care about the wilderness that the trail um, goes through as well. And so um, to support that mission, we do all sorts of different stewardship work from um, acquiring land in order to protect it and the, the nature that it holds to managing invasive species along the trail, to carrying out a restoration on our BTC lands. And of course, one of the things we do is citizen science projects like this iNaturalist project. And so this iNaturalist project is really um, one piece of the stewardship puzzle and it's a really important part of our work. And so we're so grateful to have you uh, contributing to it. And the Niagara Escarpment is just really an amazing and diverse ribbon of wilderness in Ontario. It's a UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve, and it actually has the highest species diversity of any biosphere reserve in Canada. So it's just a really special treasure that we have here. It contains over 1,500 species of vascular plants, including 40% of Ontario's rare plants. We have 50 species of fern and 44 species of orchid that call the Niagara Escarpment home, as well as a number of wildlife species, including 34 species of reptiles and amphibians, 55 species of mammals, 90 fish, and over 300 birds. And so we thought the iNaturalist project would just be a great way to showcase this diversity and to catalog it for everyone to see. And so with that, as Megan mentioned, we started this project in 2018, well before I joined the BTC, and we had a couple of goals in mind. Um, and before I go into that, I just want to point out that with, I think, one exception, all of the photos you see uh, in the slideshow today have been contributed uh, through observations to the iNaturalist project. So I wanted to be able to showcase some of your great observations. Uh, so if some of them look familiar, they might be yours. And, um, and some of them have been cropped from the originals, but um, they are your observations. So with our iNaturalist project, one of the goals is to collect data and create this great database that we can use to support our other stewardship work. So for example, um, because we acquire land along the Niagara Escarpment, um, we're always looking for information about that land so that we know uh, what areas we should prioritize for acquisition and protection. So for example, if we see that there are observations of um, at-risk species or sensitive species in a given area, that might tell us that that should be a priority area for us to protect. Um, furthermore, if we know that there are species at risk on some of our lands due to the iNaturalist project, then we know that we can be doing stewardship work on those lands to help support those species. In addition, if we have observations on our iNaturalist project that indicate that there's invasive species in a certain area of the trail, then um, we can go out to that area of trail and do some invasive species management. So it's a way for us to do some prioritizing in terms of where we're gonna focus along the trail in terms of management. And finally, as Megan mentioned, I run our landowner stewardship program, which is a program where we work with private landowners along the trail uh, to assist them in caring for their land. And so the data that we collect from my naturalist can again help me to um, prioritize certain areas where I might want to reach out to a landowner and say, hey, we noticed that there's this species on your property. Are you interested in doing some work to um, protect it? Or are, are you interested in managing these invasive species that we found on your property? So you can see that this is just a really great project um, that can support a lot of our different stewardship work that we're already doing. And then the other goal of this project is to create a community of people that we know are out on the trail, they're avid hikers and nature lovers, and it just creates a space where we can share observations with each other and we can learn from each other about the nature that surrounds us. And so with that, um, Oh, sorry, new slide, there we go. Um, and so I, this is our sort of quick snapshot summary um, and I, upload, uh, I updated these numbers this morning. And so as of this morning, there were 10,473 observations on our project, which is amazing. 
those observations um, were divided into 1,402 different species, and they were contributed by 60 citizen science. So 60 of you are out there contributing to this project. And on the right, this is pulled right from our project page, and this is just uh, sort of a snapshot of where those observations are. And you can see they pretty much follow where the trail is, of course, and there's really no uh, section of trail that has been left out here. These observations are all along the trail, which is really amazing. And so that's sort of our quick snapshot. And I will note that um, although these numbers are up to date as of this morning, uh, some of the graphs and charts that I'm showing you um, are updated as of sort of the beginning of December, because that's just when I started doing the analysis. So just a note, um, shouldn't make too much of a difference, but just so you're aware. So I wanted to start off by talking about our most popular species. So this is the species that was observed the most times in our project. Uh, and it is the butternut, which ironically is an endangered species in Ontario. And so we had 155 observations of butternut as of December, 2020. And this is a tree that you can find um, throughout the Niagara Escarpment. And it's related to the black walnut. And so it has these um, deep ridges on its bark, similar to the black walnut. But for the butternut, the ridges are kind of flattened on the top. So someone once described this to me as it looks like someone took an iron and sort of flattened out the ridges. So that's one way you can uh, tell the butternut if you're walking along and trying to identify it. It also has these really large compound leaves made up of a number of different leaflets. And it of course has these large oval shaped green fruits that are really important food sources for wildlife. Another identifying feature of the butternut is um, shown in this picture in the middle here. And so the leaf scar, which is the part of the twig where a leaf has fallen off, um, a lot of people say it looks like a monkey face. So I don't know if you can see that in the picture here, um, but that's sort of a distinguishing feature for the butternut. And the black walnut also has this monkey face on its twigs, but the butternut is the one that has sort of a, a hairy sort of eye, eyebrow above the eyes on the um, monkey face. So uh, if you're looking and trying to understand how I, to identify this species, those are some sort of tips and tricks. But as I mentioned, the butternut is an endangered species in Ontario, and it's endangered because of an invasive fungal disease called the butternut canker. And so this is a disease that um, it can create sort of sunken in cankers along the trunk, or it sometimes creates sort of sooty black marks along the trunk. So those are some sort of signs of the canker. And what it does is it basically kills the living tissue just inside the bark. And so that prevents the flow of nutrients and water from moving through the tree. And so that can kill the tree over time. And so unfortunately, a lot of our butternuts um, have been affected by this disease. However, we do know that there are some uh, healthy trees along the Bruce Trail as well. And so it's really helpful that if you do see butternut trees that you upload those observations because then one of the other ecologists on staff who's a, a butternut health assessor can go and assess the health of this tree and see if it might be still healthy. And those healthy trees are really important because if they show some resistance to this disease, then they can be helpful in the recovery efforts for this species because there is research ongoing um, looking at whether we can develop disease resistant varieties of the butternut. So that's just sort of a snapshot of our most popular species on our um, iNaturalist page. And I thought it was really neat that it happens to be this special endangered species in Ontario. Next, I wanted to sort of turn the spotlight on you, our citizen science volunteers. Um, we so appreciate um, any and all observations that you can submit to the project. And as I mentioned before, we have 60 people helping us with this. So that's really great. Uh, I wanted to uh, congratulate our winner sort of for the most, most observations submitted to the project. That's um, Jeremy Graves. And uh, he had just under 3000 species submitted to the project as of December. So just really incredible work. In terms of the most unique species submitted to our project, that goes to Pop B25, who's actually Brian, one of the ecologists on staff here at the BTC. And so he's submitted 684 different species to the project. But of course, he has a bit of an unfair advantage because he does spend a lot of his working hours uh, along the trail. So uh, it makes sense that he would have a lot of species to submit to the project. 
And so what I've just shown here on the right is a map of Jeremy Graves observations. You can see he's been all over the place with his observations, which is great. And on the uh, bottom here is just a snapshot of a few of the species that Brian has submitted to the, uh, to the project. Um, the next thing I looked at just sort of for fun was which observations were closest to either end of the trail, to the cairn at either end of the trail. And I was wondering, oh, maybe it's going to be some uh, northern species uh, at the top and some sort of specialized to the more southern climate uh, at the bottom of the trail, but that's actually not what happened. Um, so in terms of the observations that were closest to either end of the trail, uh, in the Niagara section, it was an observation of yellow trout lily by Margaret Northfield. And this is actually a species that can be found throughout southern Ontario. In fact, we do have observations all along the trail for this species. Um, and if you're wondering, it gets its name, the trout lily, because of the sort of modeling uh, of the leaves. The coloration of the leaves is similar to the modeling you might see on a trout. And at the northwest end of the trail in Tobermory, the observation that was closest to the end of the trail was an observation of staghorn sumac by Jason Miller. And again, um, it's not some sort of specialized northern species. It's actually um, a very generalist species. You've probably seen it along the side of the road or in another disturbed habitat. And it can, in fact, be found throughout southern Canada and the US. So, it was just interesting that these two observations are a species that can actually be found all along the Bruce Trail and are kind of representative of southern Ontario, Ontario flora in general. Um, and so our observations covered a huge diversity of life. Um, and we actually covered five different kingdoms of life with our observations, which I think is really amazing. Um, so as Megan said, probably because the, the project started as capturing plants, um, you can see that over three quarters of the observations are of plants. And I just have one example here. This is wild bergamot, which grows in fields and sort of uh, sometimes along roadsides and it's in the mint family. And then uh, after plants, um, fungi and animals were the next most popular um, kingdom when it came to observations. And so we just have an example here of witch's hat and this is a green frog here. And so we can see that plants, fungi, and animals made up the vast majority of our observations, but we did have a few other things in there as well. And so we had 31 observations from the kingdom protozoa. And these are basically single-celled organisms. Um, and in our case, most of these observations were of uh, slime molds. And so slime molds are these organisms that can exist in sort of a single-celled state but they can also aggregate together and form these reproductive structures that look kind of like fungi um, to the passerby, but they're actually a completely different kind of organism. And so the example we have here is called wolf's milk, and you might find it on logs in forests. And then finally, we had one observation of a bacteria, and um, this was a cyanobacteria called star jelly. It's a nitrogen fixing bacteria and it's also photosynthetic, which is really neat. And you can often find this sort of gooey looking um, bacteria um, in and among mosses. So that's one that you might wanna look out for and see if we can increase the number of bacteria in our project um, just to kind of capture the whole diversity of life. But I think um, this sort of um, graph here just captures uh, what incredible diversity we have along the Niagara Escarpment um, and the amazing things that you've captured. So because we had such an abundance of plants, I wanted to sort of take a minute to talk about the diversity of plants that we have in the project and to showcase just a few of the observations um, that came in for plants. So we had 8,380 observations of plants as of uh, December last year, and those divided out into 874 different species from 151 different plant families. So really, really incredible. We had everything from non-vascular mosses and liverworts. Um, so you can see here, this is Ontario rhodobrium moss and snakewort, uh, which is a liverwort. We had spore producing vascular plants like this marginal wood fern and this field horsetail. And I should note that marginal wood fern was one of our most commonly observed species as well. Um, found all along the Bruce Trail. 
And then, of course, we had um, some conifer trees. So these are seed plants, but they don't flower. Uh, so this is the tamarack, which is a deciduous conifer tree. So this is a tree that loses its needles in the winter, which is really interesting. And then finally, we had a huge diversity of flowering plants. So we had grasses and sedges, like this bladder sedge on the left. We have the bright red fruit of a jack-in-the-pulpit here. There's our provincial flower, the white trillium, some paper birch, and finally, from the very diverse aster family, we have a New England aster here. And so obviously these are just a few of the observations out of 8,000, but I think they just really showcase um, the, the diversity of plants that we have along the Niagara Escarpment. And it's not surprising, as we know, 40% of Ontario's rare plants are found along the Niagara Escarpment. I also wanted to showcase just a few pictures of the, of the animals that were recorded here. And I've got sort of a breakdown by the different groupings of animals on the left here. So over half of our 727 observations of animals were of birds. So um, lots of bird lovers out there. But that was actually followed by insects, which I thought was really neat. So we had almost 200 observations of insects, 43 amphibians, 33 mammals, 30 reptiles, 40 arachnids, five, sorry, 14 arachnids, five mollusks, four millipedes, two fish, and then two observations that were sort of couldn't be fit into a grouping um, because they just weren't uh, identified down to the species level. And um, so on the left here, I've just got different examples of, of those different groupings. So we've got this lovely scarlet tanager. Um, this is a golden metallic sweat bee. So this is one of our native bee species, which is really neat. We have an Eastern newt and here's a North American porcupine. And I should note for the mammals that a lot of our observations of mammals, because they can be a little bit hard to capture on camera, they were observations of tracks or fur or scat or something like that. So just sort of a reminder that um, if you can't get a good shot of the animal itself, you can always take a picture of one of the signs of that animal and upload that as an observation. And even though you might not be verified down to the species, it's still sort of information that we can use. Um, as an example of a reptile, I've got this lovely snapping turtle here. This is a gray cross spider, and this one was actually submitted by our CEO, Michael McDonald. A western dusky slug down here a black and gold flat millipede here, and then brook trout here. So again, just um, an amazing selection of the, a few of the uh, animals that live along the Niagara Escarpment. One of the things I was really excited to look at with this project was observations of species at risk. And so species can be designated as at risk at both the federal and provincial level. Um, basically, a committee of experts reviews the data on their population trends and threats that are they're facing, and then will classify them as at risk or not, and they'll put them into um, a different, different groupings. So they can be classified as endangered, threatened, or special concern, or extirpated. So basically, extirpated means they no longer live in the wild in Ontario. And then endangered is sort of, they're still here, but they're quite um, at risk. And then we have threatened and special concern is sort of the least uh, at risk type species. And threatened and endangered species are protected by legislation. So there's restrictions on uh, what you can do with them and what you can do to their habitat. And so it's really important for us to know um, where species at risk are. And so if you do see one, uh, please upload your observation because it helps us to know uh, if they're on our land, then we know that we need to manage the land in order to um, help them thrive. So here I've just listed all of the threatened and endangered species observations that were submitted to the project, and the numbers just refer to how many observations of each. <clears throat> So the first, um, so a lot of the threatened species uh, are primarily threatened because of loss of habitat or alteration of habitat. So the bobolink, uh, which we have a picture of here, this is a grassland bird. So it traditionally would have nested in um, prairies and meadows and that kind of thing. 
And because a lot of these prairies have been lost due to development, um, they now also nest in hay fields and pastures. But they're still threatened because of um, certain agricultural practices that can make it hard for them to um, reproduce successfully. So that's certainly one that we keep an eye out for. Um, we have barn swallows, which again are threatened by a decrease in nesting availability. And so um, a lot of old wooden structures that they would have nested in have been taken down in recent years. And so that's created a bit of an issue for them. And they're also threatened by uh, reduction in insect populations as well. The lakeside daisy is this lovely little uh, yellow flowered plant um, and it lives in alvars in Ontario. These are uh, thin soiled limestone uh, pavements and they're just a really rare habitat in Ontario and they're also um, threatened by quarrying and that kind of thing and so that's why the lakeside daisy is on this list. And finally we had one observation of dense blazing star. That's this beautiful um, pink flowered plant over here. Um, and this one lives in prairies and savannas, which again, they're just a threatened habitat in Ontario. And so all of the species that call that habitat home are also under threat. And so we really appreciate um, all of these observations and it helps us know where things are and um, then we know what we can do to help them. In terms of endangered species, um, they're facing some different kinds of threats. And so I already talked about the butternut, which is threatened by the um, butternut canker. Um, American ginseng is also on this list and that's the plant that you see here. And this one's actually at risk um, primarily due to our over harvesting. So this is used as a medicinal plant and unfortunately it has small population sizes. And so harvesting and continual harvesting of this plant has caused it to be um, endangered. And finally, we had one observation of Eastern flowering dogwood. This is a really beautiful shrub in Ontario. And similar to the butternut, this one is dealing with an invasive disease. So um, the dogwood anthracnose fungus um, has come in and unfortunately really decimated the flowering dogwood population. So that's sort of a snapshot of our species at risk. Um, I did want to mention that um, if you are uploading an observation of a species at risk, it's important to double check that your uh, location is set to obscured. And so what that means <coughs> is that um, the exact location coordinates aren't going to be visible to the general public. So these observations will show up as like a little circle on the map instead of a pin. And that circle will kind of be randomly placed in the general area where it was observed, but not the exact location. And this is important um, just because we do have issues with like foraging and harvesting of certain plants, especially in Ontario. So I already mentioned the ginseng. And so um, just for the species survival, it's best that we don't have a whole bunch of people knowing exactly where to find it. And even if harvesting isn't an issue, um, if we have a really rare, um, into, uh, rare species, we don't want a whole bunch of people flocking to that location. It can kind of cause disturbance to the habitat and that kind of thing. Um, what I will note though, is if you do want the exact location coordinates to be visible to us at the DTC, um, that's something that you can change in your project settings. So you can actually make it so that you're obscured coordinates are visible to curators of the projects. That would be the staff at the BTC. And so that way we can know where it is on our land, but not the whole general public knows exactly where it is. So that's just an option to keep in mind if you are uploading observations of species at risk. Um, and certain species are automatically obscured by iNaturalist, but it's always good to check. Okay. So now I'm moving on to talking about um, how many of our species in the project are native to Ontario. And people use different definitions of the word native to describe um, wildlife and, and organisms. Um, but generally native species are species that have been present in a given location. So in this case in Ontario prior to European settlement. And so these are um, organisms that have been on the landscape for a really long time. They've um, adapted to the conditions of this landscape, so the climate and that kind of thing. And they've um, evolved over time to have um, intricate relationships with the organisms around them. And so these are um, 
species that are really integral to supporting our native ecosystems. On the other hand, exotic or non-native species are species that have been introduced to Ontario from other parts of the world, usually by humans. And so they just don't have the same sort of relationships with the other organisms in this area. And so they just don't contribute as much to our native ecosystem functioning. And I'm gonna leave uh, invasive uh, for a moment and just um, move on to talking about this uh, pie chart over here. And so this is showing the percentage of species in our, pro in our iNaturalist project that are native. And so you can see that 63% are native and another 17% are non-native or exotic. And then we just have 20% here where um, either the observation wasn't identified down to the species level. And so we can't say whether it's native or not, or it's from a group of organisms that's not very well studied. And so we don't have information about whether it's native to Ontario. So the great thing is that over half of our observation or half of our species are native to Ontario, um, but we do still have a significant portion that are not native to Ontario. <clears throat> and so invasive species are non-native species that tend to have negative impacts on our native ecosystems. And so these are species that tend to be really aggressive. They can really aggressively outcompete uh, native species. And so they can um, decrease the biodiversity of our ecosystems. And so these are species that we really want to manage so that um, our native species can thrive in this environment. And so with that in mind, I'm going to spend a few slides talking about some of the common invasive species that you might encounter along the trail. And we'll go over sort of how to identify them so that you can uh, upload observations of invasive species um, so that we know where they are and how we can manage them. And it's just good to know when you're along the trail um, if there are invasive species present so that you can take actions to prevent their spread. So for example, if you know that you're walking through an area of um, say dog strangling vine and it's seeding, then you know that you should make sure to clean off your clothes and your boots before you move to a new area and make sure that you've uh, taken all the seeds off your dog who might have run through the, the stand of plants. So it's great to be able to identify those common species, uh, invasive species for that reason. So the first one I wanted to talk about is called garlic mustard. We had 46 observations of this uh, species in our project. <clears throat> Although I know that there is a lot of garlic mustard along the trail, so there could certainly be many more observations. And so this is an understory species. It can sort of carpet forest floors in some areas and make it difficult for native plants to grow. And it's a biennial, which means it lives for two years. And so in the first year, it produces what we call rosette leaves. And so the top picture here is a picture of what the rosette leaves look like. They're sort of kidney shaped, they're close to the ground. Um, and um, you'll just see this the first year. So you won't see any flowers, anything like that. But then the second year it produces a flower stalk. And so that's what you're seeing in these other two pictures. So it's a stalk, it has sort of smaller leaves along the stem and then these little white flowers at the top. And those white flowers will then produce these thin pods that have a whole bunch of seeds inside that are ready to disperse. And another identifying feature of this one is that if you crush the leaves, they tend to smell garlicky, hence the name. So this is thought to have been intentionally introduced in Ontario um, as a food plant for people and you can actually eat it. Um, so if you are interested, you can go online and look up recipes for garlic mustard pesto and all sorts of things. Okay, so that's garlic mustard. <clears throat> Another really common invasive species along the Bruce Trail is common buckthorn, and there's 37 observations of this one in our project so far. This is like a large shrub, small tree, and um, you can recognize it in a few different ways. One is by the glossy bark, which I'm showing in this picture here. And so it kind of looks like, um, if you're familiar with like sweet cherry trees, it kind of has a similar looking glossy bark. Um, this plant, you'll have either a male tree or a female tree. And so the female trees produce berries. They start off as sort of tiny little green berries and then they mature into these dark black berries here. And then 
Um, another identifying feature is that the end of the twig is sharp like a thorn, hence the name. And finally, it has these really glossy dark green leaves and the veins are really noticeable, the leaf veins, and they sort of curve towards the tip of the leaf. <clears throat> so those are all ways that you can identify the, the buckthorn. And this is a really um, aggressive species as well. So it can form really dense stands in forests and in more open areas, and it can make it really difficult for young trees to um, mature and to grow up because it really shades the understory. Okay, next we have dog strangling vine. This is also known as swallowwort, but I prefer the name dog strangling vine because it kind of um, emphasizes how sort of aggressive this species can be. Um, and we have 15 observations of this one in our project so far. So this is a twining vine. It's actually in the milkweed family. It's not a woody vine, so it does die back to the ground uh, every winter, but um, it certainly does sort of get tangled up in uh, vegetation, particularly when it becomes really dense. And this can invade um, fields and also sort of more open areas in forests as well. So this plant has glossy green leaves. They always emerge from the stem in pairs. And then you'll notice these little tiny maroon colored flowers that it produces. And then those mature into these thin green pods that later on in the summer, they turn brown, they'll split open and will release uh, white fluffy seeds. So if you are familiar with milkweed and the way that those pods look, this one's really similar looking to that, except the pods are a lot thinner. Um, and this plant is um, particularly dangerous for monarch butterflies um, because it's in the milkweed family. Sometimes monarch butterflies will get confused and they'll lay their eggs on this plant, but the larvae cannot survive on this plant. They cannot develop into adults on this plant. And so it sort of tricks the monarch into laying its eggs where um, the young will not be successful. So if you do like monarch butterflies, this is a good plant to watch out for and uh, we try to manage it where we can. The next uh, invasive plant on our list here is um, a Tartarian honeysuckle. We had six observations of this one in our project, um, but there's actually a few different non-native honeysuckle species in Ontario um, and they all look kind of similar. So I'm kind of grouping them all here. Uh, this is also sort of a large shrub. It tends to have multiple stems and light brown bark. The leaves emerge from the twig in pairs and they have really smooth edges. They tend to be sort of a light green color. It has uh, quite pretty showy flowers. Um, usually they're white or pink and then they mature into bright red or sometimes orange berries. And one ID feature that you can look for is the flowers and the berries. They tend to come out in multiples of two. Um, so they might be clustered in two or four uh, to a cluster. Um, I will point out that there are some native honeysuckle species in Ontario as well, um, and you can distinguish the two usually. Um, if you break a twig, the non-native honeysuckles tend to be hollow on the inside, so that's just a little ID tip. The final invasive plant I wanted to talk about today is giant hogweed, um, and we had two observations of this in our project. This isn't one that you're going to see too much along the trail. It kind of likes wet areas like along streams or in ditches. Um, but I wanted to bring it up just because it is um, a little bit hazardous. So it's certainly one that we want to know about if it is along the trail. This is a really large plant. It's in the carrot family and it can grow three to five meters tall and the leaves can be up to one meter wide. So it's really huge like over your head when it's mature. Um, it has these really spiky jagged leaves like you can see here. And when it's flowering, it has sort of an upside down umbrella shaped flower cluster of tiny white flowers. If you're familiar with Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot, it looks similar, the flower, except a lot bigger. And the reason that we wanna watch out for this one is because the stem and the leaves contain a sap that um, if it gets on your skin and then is exposed to sunlight, it causes really severe burns. You may have heard about this one in the news. Um, it's not one that you wanna mess around with. Um, and so uh, if you see it, um, report it, but certainly don't touch it. 
Um, so those are sort of the five, top five invasive plants that I um, just went through now. There are certainly others. And if this is something you're interested in, um, there's a lot of resources online. So you can check out uh, OntarioInvasivePlants.ca. They have lots of resources and information there. Uh, and there's also the Invasive Species Center, uh, InvasiveSpeciesCenter.ca. Um, and that one covers not just plants, but other invasive organisms as well. So we'll move on from invasive species now. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about where these observations are. And so here I've broken down the observations by club section. So as you might know, we have nine club sections along the Bruce Trail, which are listed uh, along the bottom of this chart here, from Niagara in the southeast end to Peninsula at the northwest end. And so we can see that the most observations were in the Iroquois and Toronto sections, and then that's followed by Sydenham, Caledon Hills, and Peninsula. And so I thought it would be just kind of be interesting to see where we're getting the most activity. Um, but I do want to point out, this isn't necessarily reflective of where there's more wildlife or more diverse wildlife. Um, it probably just reflects where most of our observers are spending most of their time. So it makes sense that in the most um, populated areas around Hamilton and Toronto, we get more observations there. That said, if you're in one of these other club sections that don't have as many observations um, so far, maybe it's a personal, can be a personal project for you to bump up that number this year. And here I've actually divided the uh, observations out by land management type. Um, so um, when we're keeping track of properties here at the BTC, <coughs> we sort of divide lands into, are they public lands? Are they owned or managed by us at the BTC? Are they owned by private landowners or are they sort of like a road allowance or something like that? And so you can see that um, about half of the observations are on public lands. So this is our conservation areas, parks, city land, that kind of thing. And so when I first looked at this, I thought, oh, maybe our, our parks are more diverse or, or there's um, more wildlife there versus other land types. Um, but I did a little bit of digging and this seems to reflect basically how much trail we have on each of these land types. So um, the proportion of observations in each land type here um, pretty well correlates with the proportion of trail we have in each of these land types. So all the different kinds of lands are um, pulling their weight in terms of uh, supporting wildlife and that kind of thing. So that's kind of interesting to note. Um, the other thing that iNaturalist data can tell us about, and in fact, um, a lot of researchers um, use iNaturalist data for this purpose, is to tell us about species ranges. So um, where are they on the landscape? And um, sort of what are their limits in terms of their environmental tolerances? And so what kind of habitats do they like? Or um, what cli climatic tolerances do they have? So how far north can they go before it's too cold, for example, that kind of thing. And so um, once we get enough observations of a particular species on iNaturalist, we can kind of use this information to uh, make inferences about their range. And so I just pulled out three species from our project here to demonstrate that. Um, so I already mentioned marginal wood fern a little bit earlier. This is one of our most commonly observed species. And if you look at the map, so each of these dots is one observation from our iNaturalist project. And you can see that this fern has pretty much been observed all along the Bruce Trail. And in fact, we know that um, it's found throughout Southern Ontario. And um, so it clearly has sort of a wide range of tolerances in terms of um, you know, the climate. Um, we know that our Northern sections are, are colder than our Southern sections. They have different amounts of snowfall and rainfall, um, but this fern seems to be able to handle um, most of those different kinds of uh, climates. On the other hand, we have the northern holly fern in the middle here, and you can see that this one's much more restricted. It's only found in the northern sections along the Bruce Trail. <coughs> and so, um, in fact, this is a species that's actually found on the west coast, and then it's found uh, in very specific locations around the Great Lakes here. And so that's why we're seeing this restricted range for the northern holly fern. And then in contrast to that, we have the American bladder nut which you can see is only found in the very southern portion along the Bruce Trail. And it doesn't really go much more north than the, north, the tip of Lake Ontario here. 
So American bladdernut is what we call a Carolinian species. So it's only found in the Carolinian zone of Canada, which is basically the southern portion of southern Ontario, below the tip of Lake Ontario and kind of down towards southwestern Ontario. And of course, it's found in warmer climates in the US as well. And so it's just kind of an interesting thing that once we get enough observations of a given species, we can start to sort of detect these patterns. So that kind of concludes the um, sort of data analysis portion of the webinar. So I hope that that was interesting for you and you got a sense of um, how we can use this data and why it's valuable to us. So I just wanted to talk briefly about sort of our um, priorities moving forward in terms of the kind of data that we're hoping to collect with this project. So, I mean, every observation is valuable. It tells us about um, the diversity along the Bruce Trail and along the Niagara Escarpment. So certainly any observation that you contribute is appreciated. Um, but we had sort of a couple key priorities that we're hoping that um, if you uh, are so interested, you can focus on for, for this year. And so the first one is invasive species. So I mentioned before, um, information on where invasive species are along the trail helps us to know where we should be managing them uh, the most. And so um, when you can upload those observations, it really helps us. And you can also feel free to, when you're uploading an observation in the notes section, feel free to add notes about say the size of the infestation. So is this like an isolated individual plant or is this a whole patch of the plants, for example? And that just gives us a little extra information. So if we wanna go out there and manage it, we know what we're dealing with. Um, the other thing that I'd encourage you to continue uploading is any observations of sensitive or some of those species at risk that we talked about. <coughs> as long as they're visible from the trail and um, making that observation doesn't mean disturbing them in any way. So um, we certainly don't want observations to come at a cost to the species that's being observed. So that's just something to keep in mind. And if you can't get a great shot of that, um, that bird or whatever it is you're trying to observe, you can always upload without a picture as well. It can't be verified by um, an expert, but it's still an observation that we can use uh, for our own purposes. And finally, in keeping with the theme of sort of 2020 and now 2021, um, uh, we encourage you to, to observe uh, right in your own local area. So right now, while we're sort of not able to travel as much, it's a great opportunity to just kind of get out in wherever you live and, and see what's living there. So those are our three sort of um, priority areas for this year. And um, we look forward to getting your observations for, for those three things. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to end with a few reminders. I'm sure that these are um, things that you probably already know about, but never hurts to go over again. So the first one is just a reminder to stay on the marked trail. Um, even though there might be interesting things um, beyond and off trail, um, we just wanna make sure that we're having um, a minimal footprint on the ecology of the area and that we're not trampling plants or anything like that. Um, in keeping with that, um, please feel free to take photos, but just remember to leave um, plants and rocks and everything wherever you found them, um, just so that again, we're not disturbing the area. A reminder to stay safe and follow all of the COVID-19 protocols for your area. And again, um, please consider just staying local and, and enjoying the nature in your backyard. Um, and finally, like I said, um, when I was talking about the species at risk, if you can check and make sure that you're sharing your hidden coordinates with the Bruce Trail Conservancy curators on your project settings, um, that just gives us a bit more information about your observations. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all again for um, all of your contributions to the project. Um, I've put Megan's email down there at the bottom. So if you do have questions um, after today, you can feel free to uh, email her. Um, but other than that, we're happy to take a few questions now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mara. That was incredible. Uh, it's so cool just to kind of see it all coming together after the last three years. And um, I know there's people on this call tonight that have been with us since the beginning of the project. And I hope that you've really enjoyed kind of seeing where we've come. Uh, we don't have any questions right now. Oh, 
got one just in the nick of time. Uh, if anybody else has any other ones, feel free to submit them now. Um, someone mentioned, uh, they said, do you want observations from our local area added to the Bruce Trail project? Um, and I think as long as they're on the Bruce Trail or a side trail, we, we'd love to see them. Um, but again, we are still just focusing on that kind of corridor along the main trail and along the side trails. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Richard. Uh, and I've got another question here from Sandy. And that question is, is wild parsnip an invasive species? Mara? Yes, yes. So wild parsnip is also in the same family, uh, the carrot family as wild hog or giant hogweed. Um, so that one is another one to watch out for and it can also cause that same uh, reaction on your skin. Um, so that one has yellow flowers instead of white, but it's also one to uh, keep an eye on and it can be quite common in certain areas. So definitely one to kind of familiarize yourself with um, and make sure that you're not brushing up against uh, when you're walking. Great, thanks Mara. We've got another question here. Uh, were there any surprises or anything you didn't expect to find from the observations? Hmm. <laughs> um, I guess I say, I'd say I was pleasantly surprised to see um, observations of some of the less common species. It's like, it's good to know where those are. I mean, and that information is now all integrated into um, our databases on, on our end. And so that's been a really nice thing to see. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. That, that question was from Joe. Thanks, Joe. Um, any other questions from anybody? I'll give you a couple seconds if you're typing. Uh, and again, just thank you for joining us this evening. We, this has been a long time coming. We're really excited to be sharing this data with everybody. Uh, oh, just one more question here uh, from Sandy again. Is there any value to adding species year after year from the tr same trail section? I would say yes. And uh, the reason is that even if it's the same species, it gives us information about how things might be changing over time. So um, especially if you have a picture, um, it gives us information, for example, on how um, plants might be responding to climate change. So if we see that, um, you know, this year we have an observation from you that says this plant was flowering at, you know, on June 1st or something. And as we go along, if we see five years from now, now that plant starts flowering on May 15th or, or whatever it is, then that does give us information about changes and how how species are responding to changes in the environment. So I would say yes to that. Thanks, Mara. And thanks for the question, Sandy. Uh, we might be, that might be it. I'll give everybody a couple seconds in case that triggered anything else. Any other thoughts? Let's see. Well, it's looking like that might be it. Um, but if you do think of any other questions, you've got my email, uh, send me an email. And if we need to loop Mara in, we definitely will and get her to help with some answers. Uh, she's got a lot of knowledge and expertise, as you can see, and we're lucky to have her. So thank you, Mara, for uh, you. providing all of that. Uh, oh, one quick question from Jason. Uh, are there any plans for a bio blitz in 2021? I can answer that one. We are gonna try. We are going to try and do something more. I don't know if you've given that any thought as well, but um, no concrete plans yet. But we've talked about it. We just we just need to figure out the best way to go about that. Um, just keeping in mind uh, kind of COVID restrictions, traveling, um, and see how we want to do that. But it's it's on our brain. We've talked about it, so we'll keep you updated on that, Jason. Thanks for that question. Um, all right. Okay, if there are any other questions, please feel free to send me an email and we'll do our best to answer. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to join us tonight. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, there's another webinar coming up open to Bruce Trail members in March on spring flowers. So if you're looking for some kind of similar content, please feel free to jump on that one. You can register for that through our Bruce Trail website. Uh, under events and under webinars, you'll be able to find the link there. 
uh, and we'd love to have you join us for that if you're interested. Uh, otherwise, I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you again, Mara, for doing this for us. We're really excited to see this data and we're looking forward to the future of this program. So have a good night, everybody. <laughs>